Hey, Jenny, what's up? Look, we're here. It's June. We've made it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, our last uh, show, we we, we kind of hoped that uh, we would get to June and that there would be audience participation and that somebody would like us and allow us to keep doing this. And here we are. It's now June and we're still here. We're still here. We're still here. And it's a really great week. Um, actually, a really great week. So welcome, everyone, to Midwich Live, your favorite Friday AV talk show streaming around the world via Midwich's YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Twitch socials. Don't forget to uh, post questions and comments through the chat function on whichever platform you are joining us on. And if you don't get a chance to watch today's show in full, don't worry. You can go back and watch it via Midwich's YouTube channel. Just search the Midwich group. Please don't forget to subscribe. And if you don't like our pretty faces, the show is also available in podcast format as well via Midwich Sounds. But the reason it's a great week today is that Midwich are officially the best company to work for, Chris. Congratulations. Well, congratulations. I, I feel honored. I mean, I'm, I'm part of the group in, in, in some way or shape or form. This is awesome. Uh, what did we, uh, who, who, tell me more. I need more details. Well, it was Innovate, and I think we've actually got a, a video clip. Um, hopefully, producer Ben will post it now of the moment that it happened. Gutted, of course, that we couldn't all be there to accept in person. I had prepared a speech. Um, so there it is. Ooh. Innovation Awards 2021. Let's find out for 2021, best place to work. Shortlisted for this award are Clever Touch Technologies, K Array. Maverick AV Solutions, Midwich. The winner is Midwich. Look at that. That is awesome. And by the way, this is live for the uh, uh, person out on uh, out on uh, Twitch that is watching this. We are live right now across all the social channels. Congratulations, Jenny, because I know that this happened uh, in London and uh, this uh, the awards uh, presentation. So this is kind of cool. Is this the first time that Midwitch has won this? No, actually, I think we won um, the same or a similar award in 2018. Um, so, you know, we've, we've been the best company to work for for a long time. But no, it, it's, it's great. And do you know what? It comes at a, a really great time to be recognized as winning an award for, you know, for culture and, and as a place to work after such a trying 18 months in like the pandemic. I, I think maybe it means more now because it's happened now. So yeah, really, really, really great. And uh, thank you for those that are clapping for us on, on social media. Um, so yeah, so let's talk about today's show. We mm -hmm. are at summer school, I think. Yeah, we are definitely in summer school now. Granted, we did not fail anything, but unfortunately, <laughs> producer Ben has taken us by the ear and said, you are going to attend summer school. Uh, actually, this is a topic we both like and uh, both have a, a uh, strong feelings about. We're going to get into the higher ed and K through 12 and ed tech uh, conversations. We brought on two great guests, uh, really they're both, great guests. and they're, they're both experts in their field. Um, and I can't wait to have them join because uh, even in our early meetings with them, they brought up some great points and I hope that uh, it comes across. Yeah, yeah. So let, let's um, put out a couple of questions so that we can get a feel from today's viewing audience. Um, those of you that have children um, re really need to know what has your experience been of your online learning, your home learning. And this isn't us asking for you to praise or judge yourselves as um, parents stroke teachers in the time off. I'm asking about your schools. Um, did you did you feel that the learning experience was good? Was it beneficial? Um, or have you been left maybe a little worried about what catch up there is left to do um, as we've now returned in, in most countries to, to in-person learning? Um, but we have probably the, you know, one of the most expert uh, guests to join us um, for the K through 12 discussion. And we, we've chosen to have two guests today, which is a first for us. So it could go horribly wrong. And we're probably going to overrun the show. And for the first time, we have a really good excuse. Um, <laughs> but we're sort of splitting our conversations up because we, we wanted to address uh, compulsory education and higher education separately. And the reason for that is that in compulsory education, 
I believe there there is no choice but to return back to in-person learning because at that age, when you're in that stage of development, it's so important to be around peers and 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 so on and to learn from others and learn the social um, interaction skills that come with going to school. In higher education, there's more of a choice. You know, you, you, you don't necessarily, it's not as important. So we've separated those two conversations. So I believe we have a, a little sort of intro video, is that right, Chris, for our first guest, who is Giancarlo Brotto of Smart Technologies. If we play the intro video and then hopefully he can join us. Absolutely. Let's go right to the videotape, producer, producer Ben. Videotape. Show my age. <laughs> the lessons taught in a classroom prepare students for what's to come in the real world. A passionate teacher makes those lessons memorable. Empowered with the right tools, they can capture their students' attention and imaginations. Introducing our completely new lineup of SmartBoard Interactive Displays for Education. The MX series has all of the essential interactive features educators need to transform static content into engaging experiences. The 6000S series adds exclusive ToolSense technology designed to bridge physical and digital learning like never before. Both boards include best-in-class HyperTouch, Smart Ink, and embedded IQ Android experience with all the apps you need for unmatched interactivity and ease of use. Workflows are streamlined for teachers through single sign-in access to cloud-based files, integrations with familiar platforms, plus free ready-made lessons, learning software, and training all supported by installation services, the Smart Assure warranty, and technical help anytime. Modernize any classroom, maximize instruction time, and bring lessons to life. Find out more at smarttech.com. Well, we probably don't need you anymore, Giancarlo. I think that's... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go grab some breakfast. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Welcome. Welcome, uh, Giancarlo. Please introduce yourself for our viewers. Oh, uh, well, you know, it's great, great, great to be amongst award winners. Look, uh, look how lucky I am. So uh, welcome, everybody. Giancarlo Brado here in Toronto. I'm a global education advisor at Smart Technologies, also executive director and co-founder of an organization called Catalyst, which is also powered by Smart. I'd love to tell you guys a little bit more about that. But it's exciting to be here uh, with you today to have a little conversation around uh, EdTech and uh, all things K-12 and, and then hear the conversation about higher ed. So it should be fun. Hopefully awesome. won't disrupt too much. <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget, everyone, we, we really want to hear about um, your experience with, with home learning. So simple answers. Was it good? Was it bad? Was it OK? Um, huh. Let's see what we get from that. But hey, Giancarlo, um, your smart technologies, interactive displays, interactive whiteboards, it's an in-classroom technology. So great that most people have now returned to the classroom for their learning experience. But talk to us, what, what's changed? What do you think has changed about teaching styles, expectations because of the pandemic? Yeah, you know, I think this is a, a conversation many uh, many system leaders are, are having and uh, have had, right, as uh, an instigator, which was uh, COVID and all things uh, making us think about how does learning continue when we don't have bricks and mortars and how should it continue? And I think that's the one thing, the one lesson that I think everybody's taken is that you know, we're in an era where we have access to, and we've had for quite a while, but many people weren't aware and starting to think about how do we integrate and make sure that we continue learning, continue engagement, continue, uh, you know, doing what, what we do in a brick and mortar classroom, but do it in a variety of different ways, whether that's kids are at home all year long, that was my kids this year, three of them stayed at home all year. Or whether your kids were in the classroom, but, you know, uh, maybe separated, but or uh, b ping ponging back and forth. And some teachers, you know, had to manage both right in the classroom, outside a classroom. And I think what it's opened up for all education system is realizing that we have the tools yet, as many uh, parents might uh, attest, you know, how might we be leveraging them to make sure that we're optimizing and creating learning experiences that truly add value and pull kids into learning and don't make them want to, you know, um, 
go and play with their uh, their toys at home when they're at home instead of engaging in the learning. So, so I think there's lot lots of lessons to be learned, and I think the one one big one um, is I think uh, we have a lot to do to help support our educators uh, in how to leverage these incredible uh, technologies and tools that exist, uh, hardware, software, and everything in between. So. That's one of the, the many uh, lessons that I think that have come out of uh, so far the pandemic and, and what people are still grappling with and to take forward into this next uh, school round that we're going to be approaching. Very interesting. Jean Call, I, I do have a question though. Uh, you know, do you feel that this generation of kids that are that are in school right now that are coming up in the K through 12 uh, space, this is a generation that grew up with iPads and iPhones and technology. I, I don't think they're the ones that are going to have a hard time adopting to what you guys are bringing to the table in a hybrid environment with cameras and touch pads. And I mean, we've all seen the, the, the video of the little baby trying to flip a, a mag, you know, flip a magazine like they would an, an, an iPad. Um, where is, where is the, 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 the kind of the, the, the impasse right now is with, is it with the teachers that are learning how to get to the technology? Because I don't know if it's the kids. I think the kids are very, very, very familiar with using online tools. Yeah, I mean, we, and this, this is a conversation that's been had for quite a while, right? Is that just get out of the way and let them get going. And and I think it's it really, um, it has to do with, I think, a variety of things. And one is, you know, yes, as much as, um, you know, kids are, you know, into technologies and doing it, let's go to faculties, event, teachers, colleges, right? So go hang out there for a bit where, you know, these students have been, uh, uh, you know, uh, very comfortable and on a daily basis are involved with it. But then take a look at how they integrate it into teaching practices. How do they combine the pedagogies and practices with the technology? Just because you might be technology adept, maybe doesn't necessarily mean that you are leveraging the tool in the way that you could be. And I think the same is true for students. And I think this is where teachers' guidance come in. It doesn't matter if you're a techie teacher or not. I think guidance and how we leverage any tool right? Technology or non-technology to have it add value to the work that we're doing. I think that's, those are lessons that I think that we all need to learn, even as a, us as adults, right? How we're, we're leveraging these new tools and AI and automation to do the work that we do. So I think as much as students might not be afraid of engaging with the tech, I think there's still uh, work to do to, to, to guide uh, and to support learners on how they can really truly optimize it. So I think there's learning to be had on all ends, right? Educators supporting learners, learners leveraging the tools. Uh, and it's just, uh, a, and I think the spirit of what we have to take is that of uh, constantly being learning and adapting to how these new iterations of technologies start um, start integrating into our lives, whether that's to help us with work or to help us uh, with learning. Yeah, agreed. And okay, so we've we've gone through what we've gone through. And most most of our students are back in the classroom now. Um, but let's be honest, there, there is a fair portion of, of, uh, of, of the population out there who haven't had a perfect experience with the um, learning from home. Maybe they didn't have the devices. Maybe they skipped apart before their governments came up with schemes and so on. Um, who's, whose responsibility is it now to, to help them catch up? What Can we do that as an industry? Can, can we make that happen for them? Is that maybe playing a part in SMART's roadmap? Do you guys have any content that's there for the parents that are at home going, I need to help. I need to help catch up on what I missed. Yeah, great, great question. I think, you know, as they always say, you know, a, a learner's journey is as valuable as the community that they surround themselves with. And so er everybody in the ecosystem plays a role, right? So starting from the parents at home and what they can do to support their learner. And there's incredible, you know, some things come out of it is a lot of supports for parents to do it. Uh, many people don't know this, but SMART uh, is... Um, uh, powers an organization called Funterra, uh, which is uh, crowdsource uh, activities and videos and gamified lessons. It's all students centered and that students kind of play and engage on their own to develop skills and even you know, complement what's happening in the classroom. So there's a lot of these different tools that parents can leverage or just point their, their students to and let their, their kids to and let their, them involved with it. But then of course, at the school level, right, uh, districts are, you know, in countries even, and we've been convening government officials this past year through Catalyst. And, and this is something that they're, they have to strategically plan for. Part of it is how do we know, right? Because some learners have had supplemental at home uh, in the same grade and others haven't. Some kids haven't even engaged in learning at all, right? When we know there's a lot of uh, countries and people around the world uh, in remote areas that 
literally we lost them for the entire year, year and a half. And so gauging where they're at and then creating uh, mechanisms where we can differentiate, as we've always talked about, within a school year is going to be important. And of course, uh, tools, right? And industry has a, a part to play. Uh, you know, Smart's been heavily involved with uh, the platforms that we have help kind of do with the assessments and the ongoing feedback, but then differentiating and creating tools that help a learn a, an educator at the onset of learning, like, I got to get a picture of where are my learners at today? Right. And then based on where they're at, I need to kind of customize. So tools that allow a teacher to do that analysis and then customization throughout a lesson uh, are going to be key, especially in the coming years. So, yeah, this one of the things that I've learned over the past year or, or 14 months of my of my own children uh, going through the classes is, first of all, I realize how dumb I am at this point because I do not remember half the stuff that they're learning. Don't ask me about the French Revolution. I, I can probably tutor in Spanish and in Portuguese if necessary, but please uh, do not ask me new math. I'm bad with that. So, you know, the, the parents were also put into a situation where we had to, you know, all of a sudden rediscover. And I think that there are online learning, uh, there are online learning um, uh, areas for us to pick up some stuff. The other part to this was what I noticed with my children was the interaction. Um, it wasn't traditionally a, a teacher in front of a class talking to students. It required engagement and interaction and cameras being turned on. And I think that that is the big difference. And I think that if we continue along this hybrid learning where you have some home, some some at school, um, I think that you're gonna push that and you're gonna you see more people being more engaging. And I'm hoping that that leads to better stuff because I'm watching my own kids now engaging and in, in, in moving through an online program. Now granted, they're built for this because they're, like I said, they're, they're, they're kids of technology, right? Uh, but where they started to where they are right now, much improvement where I'm still waiting for some of the teachers to, to finally understand that it's still not a lecture conversation. It's more of an engaging conversation and use the resources and the video tools and things that are out there, whiteboarding, get on that thing, you know, move and, and, and do what you got to do. So Stand up. <laughs> Stand up. Energy is created by standing up. And I can't wait until I start moving my own uh, office around so I can be more dynamic when I speak. But it's learning that. And that, that's that's something that teachers are picking up as they move along. So it's well, I'm going to ask you to virtually stand up now. So, um, Chris, where are we going? Can we can we get in the lift? Can we get in the elevator? Absolutely. So in honor of um, of Giancarlo being in Toronto and the, the Montreal Canadiens winning, I loved it for any Toronto Maple Leaf fans that are on there right now. I just, that's kind of a dig. Um, outside of that, uh, let's go to the top of the CN Tower. I've been there maybe twice in my life. I was very young, but uh, let's go to the top and uh, let's have a conversation. So this is what we do. This is kind of a little break uh, in between where we got three minutes and uh, in these three minutes, you tell me, I'm a frustrated parent. I just left my kids studying at home. I'm here. I'm going up to the top of the CN Tower. Tell me about SMART. All right. So, I mean, for those uh, that don't know, what fuels SMART is this passion and this uh, energy for this realization that any child, any learner has a capacity for greatness. And it's uh, the people that that learner gets connected to uh, that makes it uh, a reality. So it's these connections that matter uh, that, that are so important. And the way that SMARTS looks at those connections is through uh, creating tools, right? So whether it's hardware, interactive displays or software, that helps instigate these connections. So whether that connection is, you know, between two, uh, uh, you know, an um, uh, educator and a learner, or between two learners, whether those learners are in the same room or they're remotely, whether that learner has a device, an iPhone, an iPad, or uh, regardless of what it is, a computer or laptop, is creating those connections. Um, that's what matters most, and that's what Smart's been doing for actually since the world's first website came live, and even before touch was a thing, before iPads, uh, Smart was all about uh, interactivity. Uh, and physical uh, uh, um, interactivity with manipulators. So, uh, with the manipulation with the, with the hands. And so, these these tools become instigators for connections, for dialogue. That's where learning happens. But it's not just about the tools that we put in learner spaces because we have to think of the ecosystem. If you want impact, you got to involve the parents. And so that's where Smart Powers Funterra, right? So as, as early as like the young early learners before they go into a formal ed system, what can we as parents be doing? to develop skills like social emotional learning skills, right? And have it to do it in a fun way. Uh, but also we have to realize that 
you know, systems, especially education systems are complex and there's so many moving pieces when we want to create change. It's more than just having tools and support for teachers. It's, you know, supporting the administrators. And so Smart also powers Catalyst, uh, which is an organization that partners with uh, organizations that convene government officials, school system leaders. And we have conversations around, you know, especially last year, we convened over probably the most number of government officials, ministers, deputies, secretaries of states around the challenges of what was happening during the pandemic, but also all conversations related to, uh, you know, some of the um, tribulations that are happening in education and ideas of how we can get to new ways and new worlds uh, of thinking. And so uh, you know, lots of tools have come out of it. You know, if you if you are a school or a system uh, that wants to evaluate uh, how you're currently planning, looking at things like infrastructure, IT uh, support, uh, planning in terms of uh, uh, visioning and then supporting your teachers and integration of pedagogy. Uh, there's tools that are complementary that can be supported there. So SMART's very much vested and interested in you know inspiring learners uh, and doing that through connections that matter and through creating some incredible tools uh, that are instigators uh, for it. And of course, you can check it all out at smarttech.com and happy to have a conversation uh, with any of you folks that are looking to, to have more uh, more details about all that great stuff. You got my interest. You got my interest. But last question, and it's pretty much a very, I guess, a black or white question. Is SMART a technology company or are they an education company these days? Education company. Wow. Look at that. So you went from the tech and went right into the software and now have grown into something bigger than that, which is very interesting. Yeah. And very many people still see Smart as, you know, the whiteboard company. There's a lot more to Smart for Smart than Smartboard. So uh, do do check out what Smart's involved with. It's, it's all about creating impact. We're almost at the top of the uh, of the CN Tower. So thank you. This has been so enjoyable. And, and there was a bell too. There was like the doors are opening. There it is. And then he has joined us. Welcome to the lift. <laughs> so, so um great elevator pitch. We have had a question whilst you've been uh whilst you've been behind closed doors. Um Sam would like to know, Giancarlo, the the pandemic and the home learning, do you think that it is good? for in-classroom technology? Has it moved us forward or has it set us back? His question is, has it moved us forward or set us back? I think it's moved us forward, right? I think it's what it's opened up is a conversation, uh, even in my own kids' school, right? A lot of parents, sometimes some of the parents uh, out of frustration saying, hey, help, <laughs> right? And yeah, I got this iPad and my teacher is sending lessons, but we got to do more. So it's opened up a conversation around, okay, we, we might have the technology we might have the infrastructure the networks but it's it, you know having impact is way more than that uh, so i think what it's done is it's shone a light into you know how what can we learn about how to effectively use technology that has impact technology is not going to go away we're going to continue using it you know especially in uh, higher ed and, and as, as adults as well we have to leverage it right uh, to learn and so how do we better leverage it in our in our classrooms i think is uh, is key and it pushes everybody systems, uh, pushes companies to really start asking questions. It's not about just having it. How do we know that it's actually having the impact that we intended it to have? So uh, for that, I think it's been a great instigator. Oh, great. Wait, wait, I'm getting a message. Okay. Uh, you're going to have to walk down the stairs because the <laughs> elevator is now broken. Giancarlo, um, there, there's, that or there's a parachute, whichever one you'd like. Uh, <laughs> I'll take the parachute. Okay, we'll do, we'll do, do the parachute. <laughs> that was like fun. Sounds <laughs> great. Uh, let's, um, let, let's wrap this up by letting people know where they can uh, find out more about you and uh, SMART. Yeah, totally. So, so if you want to check out all the great stuff uh, that SMART uh, is doing, go obviously smarttech.com. If you haven't checked out Lumio, uh, L-U-M dot I-O, that's an online platform, doesn't involve any hardware, that's free for all teachers uh, to take and make take advantage of. So check that out. And of course, love uh, being part of the conversation. So uh, do, uh, if you like conversation, join me on Clubhouse. Uh, you can find me there at G Brotos. That's the first initial of my first name and my last name. And then of course on Twitter and Instagram. So Twitter is 4G Brotto, Instagram is 5G Brotto. Uh, and, uh, and of course, you can always uh, find me on LinkedIn. So many ways to connect and look forward to continuing these conversations. They're always, always great to have. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you for stopping by. Thank you. Oh, thanks Thank for having me. <laughs> Take care. Take care. Well, that so was interesting. It was interesting, <laughs> really interesting. Um, and, and, you know, there's just, there's a lot to think about. And I, I, I think he's right. I think we've definitely sort of leapt forward from, uh, from from where we were because of the home learning. And I, I hope to see a much wider technology adoption in, in the classroom. But we're about to move on to talk about higher ed. And I wouldn't mind just transitioning with a couple of points. So I, I have 
I have something that I feel quite strongly about. And I think it's because um, I'm mum to a stepdaughter and she is 14 and she's very into TikTok. Um, and I'm sure everyone's seen numerous uh, uh, documentaries and dramas recently about the algorithms that are there to, you know, entices and 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 how how these algorithms work in terms of presenting us with content and it's it's one for any of the the technology or thought leaders out there in this space um why can't we involve the personal device now in the classroom so we've we've sent our kids home we've told them to use their own device that their own device is what they need to continue learning we've brought them back to the classroom and we've said if we see you holding it you will get a detention or it will be confiscated. I, I don't feel like this is right. I feel that, um, you know, the educators need to stop and think because if we can deliver content on the personal device, that affects the algorithm, right? And a TikTok or something similar will start to present our students with content because they've been using their device in the classroom. And, and we can kind of just start to balance out that, um, social media versus educational content battle. But hey, I think it's time to bring in Joe Way. Um, should we talk about what I accidentally said on a different show for the first time before we bring him in? Absolutely, absolutely, because that actually caused the stir because uh, it was an upheaval because it had nothing to do with education. You were on a retail show and dropped the comment that completely threw. Uh, the, the the audience into a tizzy. And for those that are not aware, uh, Jenny was a uh, was a guest on AV Week, and they brought up a comment regarding uh, a, a retail, and you, retail is near and dear to your heart. Mm -hmm. And you made an excellent point, and I'll let you t explain what you said, and then we're going to hit Joe when he comes in because I we, we we have to surprise Joe when he walks in the door. Yeah, great. So 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 um. I've sort of teased it, I think, at the beginning of the show today, uh, compulsory education, you know, that there's so much to gain from uh, being in amongst peers, being in amongst teaching mm -hmm. staff and just other people. So they, they were always in the majority going to return to school. I'm sure a small percentage of people may have now considered home schooling uh, because of their experience, but it will be a small percentage. Higher ed, however, um, have we not demonstrated that you can stay uh, local, stay at home, stay near your family, keep your social circle and learn from home. Maybe now, um, you know, if, if I'm in the UK, maybe I want to go to USC. Maybe I want my degree to come from USC, but I don't want to have to move to the States to, to get it. I'm not really sure why I wouldn't choose to move to California, but still. Um, so are we not getting to the point where actually the same issue that's faced retail in competing against the online shopping experience and trying to draw people into the stores in bricks and mortar stores is now a problem in exactly the same way for higher ed. How do we convince the students back to campus? And hey, producer Ben, I think it's time for Joe Way to tell us. Yay, it worked. Yay. How we doing? What's up, Doc? How you doing? Oh, darn near perfect. Except I do have the bone to pick about being excited about summer, how you started the show. That's the worst time for higher ed. We don't like summer. That's when everyone's gone and we have to work. We like September, you know, through through May, where we sit back and just look at trouble tickets and tell people we'll get to it during summer. So, you know. So we're all stressed here, but that's a, that's a really, really good um, insight, uh, Jenny, about just, just, you know, what is it going to be like coming, you know, how do we entice people back? Um, you know, I think it's, it's going to really depend on our, our student bodies and the makeup of our institutions. You know, um, I believe that we did show that you could be effective uh, in a virtual world. But that's also not what this demographic wants. When you actually are bringing up, you know, TikTok and the TikTok, um, you know, yeah, demographic, let's say, the, the, the preferred viewers of it, um, that 18 to 21 want the college experience, right? They want to be able to come hang out on campus, build relationships, have the experience that they were grow that they grew up being told they're supposed to go do. 
They want to live in the fraternity and sorority houses. They want to build a network of people and peers that you really can't get in a virtual world. So this is where we're trying to figure out is how do you leverage One both of those? And that, even though we know we can be effective, uh, is it how we really want to do it? And what will the balance be between an, a fully on-prem experience, a fully online experience, and now this hybrid world we're gonna be moving into? And that's really where we have to figure out that can we support them with uh, social, you know, social aspects, whether it be, you know, the meet, the greets, the football games, and can we then leverage some of the classwork that maybe doesn't need to be, you know, in person all the time? Those are the challenges we're facing. Well, I'm still a little upset about this whole summer comment you did. I mean, you came in here and you threw a wet towel above my <laughs> my day. I was having such a good day up until you said that summer's not. Summer's good, man. Come yeah, on. It's the time you're not allowed to take PTO, right? Yeah. See, not like you who gets to put it in and get it approved. Like some of us are like, I tell my staff nothing. From July to September, you're stuck with us, okay? No. <laughs> Three days, Joe. That's all it was. It was three days. <laughs> <laughs> I just asked for three days. I got okay. It's all right. But thank you so much, Joe. You know what? I guess Jenny went right into the discussion uh, about the the retail and how to bring that and 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 an education comparison. Uh, you are fortunate because you work at a university that is uh, prettier than most. I mean, come on, palm trees, California weather. You don't have to do very much to bring people there. I mean, you got a sports program that attracts people to it that want to be there. Your, your sports programs are shown on TV on weekends. Now take yourself out of LA and stick yourself in uh, North Dakota, right? Or put yourself- Why would I want to do that? I oh. don't know, but that's <laughs> up to you. But you know, you you obviously see the challenges that are, that are there with bringing people back. Um, how is technology you know, is it is it impeding that or is it making it happen or is there a balance? Do you see? I mean, let, let, let's be frank. Beyond what you do, you've also been studying this for a long time. You you you, you developed a group, uh, which is the, the Higher Ed Tech Managers Association. You guys talk about this all the time. How do you blend technology in reality? How do you make technology a part of this without taking away from sunshine and palm trees? and allowing people to, move to, to, to have this education, be engaged and still be part of the university life. Is that even possible? Yeah, you know, that, that is a good question. And it is possible. I think what we have to recognize is the reality of the situation that's gonna be different, right? Um, we were forced online because of a pandemic, nothing anyone planned nor wanted, but we did find the good out of it, how we could leverage things like LMSs, how we could, um, leverage uh, content delivery, right? If you think about previous, you know, pre-pandemic education, it was a faculty member would stand at the front of a room and lecture. Well, we learned during the pandemic that that was not the most effective way to teach, right? We learned that giving the content, maybe pre-recording the lecture, posting that up on the LMS system, then allowing that to be consumed at the whatever the student wants to, and now leverage the uh, the class time as discussion, right? And I think that's where we're going to see hybrid learning going, where we can be able to utilize uh, all of our hybrid technologies to stream out, stream to multiple locations, have some students in class or no students in class, solely stream out the lecture, let the students consume it when it's good for them, but then have our group study times, have uh, those places where we're going to come together, whether it be as an online cohort or an on-prem cohort to build the community. So we can start to leverage a little of everything. And that's where the technology can help us because it creates that place where we can all meet on an equal level. And that's, that's kind of been the advantage we've seen over this last year. I love that. I love that that, that, that is massively taking something from, you know, how we've been pushed into this hybrid learning model and, and, pushing us forward to get more from our university experience um that that that's yeah re really great i mean I, I guess there's probably going to be um 
a, a bunch of people that aren't going to be able to make it back to campus, say, in, in the fall this year, because they are international students. Um, and I don't think it's any secret that that's a, a huge amount of revenue and income for most universities. What What's USC's plan? Uh, are, you, are you guys offering them online? How, how are you working those into your plans for, for the year? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, here at USC, we are we are proud and we love the fact that we have the highest percentage of international students of any R1 institution in the United States. Now, with that comes a unique challenge, right? We know that probably Japan, China, and India will not open up for visas prior to the start of the school year, right? That's 15 to 20% of our entire student body who could not return to campus even if we let them on campus, right? Just because they can't get here. So what we're doing is planning for that. We're trying to figure out how we can create modules where um, some of the classes might be catered to the international students. Let's also recognize too, this isn't like it's someone who lives in Jersey who can't get to class. This is someone on the other side of the world where a 10 a.m. class is actually in the middle of the night for them, right? Which is not a convenient time to actually attend. So what we wanna do is start to cater our offerings for the local time zones as well. Um, <laughs> and therefore, uh, that gives us that opportunity to actually more personalize the instruction, right? And again, going back to those things where maybe pre-recording the lectures or um, what we can find is that we can take certain sections and make multiple of them, have one for those students who do want a fully on-prem experience. And then maybe those who just can't get here, who live in certain areas of the world, now we can cater and have a gratis assistant or something, teach that section in order to cater to them at a time that's convenient for them, right? And these are challenges that we're all facing. It is, It does impact us you know, monetarily if we could not uh, be able to offer those. So we are figuring out ways to leverage our technologies to make it happen. We sure. got two comments online that uh, I would like to point out. Uh, one, uh, Aaron, your fellow uh, tech manager, has uh, <laughs> agreed that summer is rough, but she has the best YouTube uh, handle in smearing off ice. <laughs> uh, yeah, Aaron, know, but... Aaron is a rock star of our industries over there at Johns Hopkins. And um, <laughs> let, let, let me just say, it, it is true. It, it's so hard for us because this is where we have to perform. And, and we have a cutoff date. We're not allowed to be late with our installs, right? We, we have, Students are showing up when they're showing up. Move-in day is move-in day. You can't fake that date. I used to fake dates all the time as a tech manager. Oh, we need it on the first. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're going to get it to you sooner. All right. So, and then the following question that we have came in from Hannah. Hannah has a question about, do you think blended learning would have been as widely adopted as if, if it weren't or wasn't for the pandemic? Uh, absolutely not. This is the one thing you never, I mean, it's hard to say something positive, positive about a uh, global pandemic. However, it did make education move leaps and bounds above anything it would have ever done. You know, I mean, even if I think I did my PhD at the University of Birmingham in the UK, but I did most of it uh, via distance, only traveled there once a year and did most of my research uh, remote. That worked and it was effective. But what if I could have now done it now where I could have had more personalized direction with the faculty, where if I would have had the cohort where we could meet in a virtual environment, that would have been very different. And it would have actually supported my ability to learn. Now, um, I think that that's really where we're gonna start to see a lot of changes. And blended learning is one of those things that has so many possibilities that I think we don't even know yet because we've only been in a fully on-prem and a fully online. We are not yet in a hybrid blended world, right? So as the faculty come in, they're gonna to start to recognize how to be more effective and that we're gonna see some big changes. So I'm excited about how it happens. And I think that the, the faculty in a way are too, because they're gonna to get to, um, if I think of a, a tangible way here at USC, is why do our faculty now need to stop teaching uh, for an entire year to go on sabbatical to do research? Why can't they always be on research 
and teach their students from the field. How great would that be for our students to actually be able to call in, have their faculty there, you know, an archaeology faculty member could be there on a dig and teaching the students at that time, not just taking time off, coming back and then explaining it. Huge opportunities for blended learning. Excellent, excellent. And, we, excellent. and we've put all of the infrastructure in place to do it. Now we just have to use it more. That's that. That's the key, isn't yeah. it? We, we've already done it. We've been forced into doing it. Um, no, no tech manager is arguing with the faculty and, and, and the wallet holders about spending money on this stuff. It, it, it's, we've, we've accelerated. And I think that's the case for most vertical markets, isn't it? There's, um, you know, quite, quite a number of them that have really accelerated tech adoption because of the pandemic. So, wow, Joe, so great to have you on the show and get your insights. Please tell everyone how they can get in touch with you. Yeah, um, you can find me, of course, on all the socials at Josiah Way. Um, I also encourage you, if you work in the higher ed vertical in any form, fashion, you are a tech manager, go to hetma.org, come join our group. It's, 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 it's our people all coming together to support one another, so I encourage that. And of course, you can always check me out too on, at Higher Ed AV as well on the podcast and website. So there you go. Thank you so much, Joe. Appreciate it. You are a, 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 a wise man for teaching us all this cool stuff about what's going on here. Uh, but, um, you know, there's some people that have been sending me messages that UCLA is better. I don't know where they're going. <laughs> but Those people are on crack. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no bit of rivalries there. No. No rivalry. No. You no, know, that's no. the downside. It's not that I just work at USC. I also did my undergrad at USC. So I'm equally obnoxious across the board. <laughs> oh, you're one of those folks. Uh, Alumni. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Joe. Thanks for stopping by. It's been an honor and a, and a privilege. Thank you so much. Wow. Oh, brilliant. I'm inspired. I'm inspired. I'm considering going back to university. I definitely picked the wrong degree. I my job has absolutely nothing to do with it. So, so maybe this is, this is my time. Maybe it's time for me to go to USC, not UCLA. Um, yeah. And, uh, and, and, and get my engineering degree, perhaps. How, how cool would that be? So be awesome. work from anywhere, learn from anywhere. Why not? So we have to get to the very important part of the uh, show, uh, which is not when we uh, tell our guests thank you and, 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 and learn from them, which is always very good. But uh, we know that you, the watcher, the viewers, uh, are looking for the prizes. So there are prizes to be had. Uh, last month, uh, we did a show, and the winner of the 50-pound uh, 50 pack coffee voucher and D10 goodies is Sanket Sawant. Zanket, congratulations. And uh, we will be, uh, or producer Ben and the uh, marketing team will be reaching out to you to provide you with your, uh, with your cool gift pack that you received. And this month, we are out to win a $50 Starbucks voucher and a load of that smart merch. And if you don't know, Smart Tech is uh, one of the people out here. And here's the question. This is an easy one. Google it if you have to. Who did England beat in the final? Euro 2020 Group D game on Tuesday, June 22nd. If we could spell it out any 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 more, uh, please <laughs> just go find out who England beat last this this past week. And uh, very British answer, question. Go to the Midwich uh, address that's right below me, right here, which is midwich.com backslash mlco mp4, and you will get uh, your, uh, your that's where you would put your answer and uh, be in for a discussion. Um, and of course, if you're successful, it will be announced on the next show. The next show is on Friday, the 30th of July at three o'clock British summer time and 10 a.m. Eastern time. Um, and we'll be discussing the role that AV plays in live events and broadcast. So this is quite an exciting show um, because we we employ experts in, in the broadcast field. So I think we're expecting a colleague from Holden to join us um, and an exciting broadcast vendor to join us. Um, and it's not just relevant to, to live events either. You'll have an opportunity to ask these guys about how their technology is massively influencing the work from home movement um, because we're, we're all video creators, whether that's live or, or recorded content now. So really exciting show. Um, and I think it'd be really nice to to focus on the live events industry, um, who I, I, I really feel they have had the, the worst time um, in, in 
throughout this this pandemic. But hey, I think we have reached the end of the show. We're only one minute over, which for two guests, I'd say we've done really well and deserve some form of reward or pay rise. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Maybe uh, a swag bag, uh, producer Ben. We want some too. I mean, can we can we get what? with that what what's going on anyway ladies and gentlemen uh my name is chris nano i am a market development manager with starin uh, a midwich company and uh, i am joined every month with by not with by jenny uh jenny please let's give them your contact details and where they can find out more about you and midwich Absolutely. So you can find me on LinkedIn uh, as Jenny Hicks, or you can reach me on Twitter at Midwich Jenny. If you don't know who your local Midwich Group company is in whichever territory you are in, please feel free to reach out to me, Jenny.hicks at midwich.com, and I can help point you in the right direction. Chris, where can people reach you? I'm on Twitter, Chris underscore Neto. That is what it said right below. You can also find me on LinkedIn. You can find me across all the socials. And uh, I thank you all uh, for, for for coming by, doing this virtual event. We are getting closer to opening up and things starting to happen in real life. But stay, uh, stay, stay, uh, I get what's the word I want to say? We're not going away. We're going to continue doing this because uh, you guys have given us very good reports. So please continue to watch, link, subscribe, chat, engage. We're looking for all of it. Uh, and we will be back next month with our next uh, show as well. Thank you all so much for watching. And thank you all so much for engaging with us along this. So thank you so much. And that's it. See you next time. See you next